Good morning, everyone. I'm going to um, call the meeting to order. Um, just a note, President, is there, is that sound okay? Okay. Um, President Dwight Walker is on Zoom because of a COVID exposure, so I will be stepping in to um, help conduct the meeting today. Uh, Deborah, can you do roll call, please? Certainly. Walker? Here. Hamaji? Here. Ali? Here. Hurt? Here. Bentley? Here. Flaherty? Here. Harrington? Here. Meehan? Here. Topper? Here. And O'Keefe? Here. Thank you. Um, are there any changes to the May 26 minutes? Okay, seeing none, um, we will uh, submit them as approved. Um, right now, uh, we're expecting an update from Cindy Silva, our mayor pro tem. I do not see Cindy. I'm actually uh, remotely zooming in. Can you hear me? Oh, thank you, Cindy. Welcome. Thank you very much, and greetings from lovely Sacramento. I'm on my way to a meeting at the California Office of Emergency Services that starts in about an hour, and so I needed to do this remotely today. And speaking of Cal OES, I really want to tell you how pleased the city is that um, Contra Costa Fire received the grant, or at least a portion of the grant, for that will allow uh, Rossmore to see a reduction in fuel load along your border and help reduce the risk of fire. And so that is a great congratulations. And the city looks forward to assisting Rossmore in any way we can to secure the additional funds that will be needed in a subsequent round of the grant funding. So again, congratulations. We are um, currently beginning, the, well, it's we've had some hot days of summer and anticipating that we will get further hot days over the coming weeks. We, have, we are prepared to open cooling centers, one of which will be at the Tice Gymnasium on Tice Valley Boulevard, just outside Rossmore. I assume that Rossmore will also be doing cooling centers, but if not, your residents should know that these cooling centers will be available when the temperatures reach 95 degrees Fahrenheit or higher during the day. So stay tuned on that. Um, we are currently beginning work on the license agreement with the National Guard Armory, which is located downtown near Civic Park for our winter night's shelter for the homeless. I know it seems a bit impossible that we are talking about winter when we have barely um, entered the days of summer, but it does take many months to get these agreements moving forward. And we have to do these agreements every year. We cannot do a multi-year agreement with the National Guard. At our recent city council meeting, we had the second reading and final reading of an ordinance for safe gun storage. We are not precluding the ownership of guns, but we are actually um, encouraging through this ordinance that people should keep their guns either locked or biometrically locked with a locking device on the trigger. And so that has moved forward. We will not be entering people's homes to enforce this. This will be by um, it's really a, an opportunity to educate the public about the need to keep guns safely. And also, I apologize if you can hear the background noise, uh, but also that um, this is a way to reduce the likelihood of children and others who would do harm to themselves or others. This is the beginning of summer, and there are a number of activities that will be at the Lesher Center tonight. Is the first concert of five outdoor, outdoors on the Redney Plaza that will be offered every Thursday for the next five Thursdays between 5.30 and 7 p.m. So if you're downtown, please join in the fun. Also this evening, the Bedford Gallery will be opening its um, new exhibit called Cultural Currency, and it's um, contemporary art using currency as in um, physical dollar bills and things like that. And the opening event is this evening and it, the exhibit will run between today and September 18th. 
And finally, I will mention, as we all know, that Monday is the 4th of July and the city will be co-hosting with the Walnut Creek Concert Band, a celebration downtown in Civic Park. The band concert begins at 6 p.m. and everyone is invited to bring a picnic dinner and enjoy the fun and celebration. And happy 4th of July to all of you. I am happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Cindy. Does anybody have any questions for her? Um, Leanne, could I ask a question? Yes, Dwight. Hi, Cindy. So, um, Cindy, I understand the city council might be considering a uh, ballot initiative at its July meeting for increasing the local sales tax. Are, are you in support of placing that initiative on the ballot? I haven't made up my final, uh, I haven't made a final decision yet because we are still gathering input from the public and that input will help to inform um, what we need to do. So I'm a completely open mind about it at this point. There are many people who have expressed support for it, which would be a half cent increase. Um, but there are also concerns about the current state of the economy, inflation, recession, et cetera. So we have to balance all of those issues. Yeah, it's happy music. Great, thank you. Dale, you had a question? Yeah, Cindy, <clears throat> this is Dale Harrington. I, I compliment you and the other council members for the extensive work you are doing in developing provisions for outside dining in the city. Although we have an excellent restaurant here in Rossmore, Rossmore residents periodically dine in restaurants in Walnut Creek. Um, thank you very much. And we can, our work in that arena continues. We have extended the emergency orders while we transition, but we have adopted some policies that will be coming will be converted into current zoning codes and requirements over the coming months. And then we will be rolling out the more permanent um, outdoor dining program. Thank you. Yes. Cindy, this is Mary Hurt. I want to express my compliments to you and Matt and the city manager for the town hall you held here in Rosmore. I learned a lot. You guys listened really well, and I think it was totally beneficial. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Mary. And I was glad you were there, and many of you were, were there as well. And if you don't mind, Cindy, one more question. Um, as you know, we're all concerned about water usage, and I wondered if the city-owned Boundary Oaks Golf Course had recy used recycled water, and if yes, where do, what's the source of that water? So um, we are not using recycled water because we do not have the infrastructure from, in that case, it would be the Contra Costa Water District okay. that... Um, would allow us to get access to recycled water. So we are uh, minimizing our water use through a series of water saving measures. I don't have the exact figure in my head, but we have um, converted over the last eight to 10 years, acres and tens of thousands of acres of grass to um, the most drought tolerant possible. So we continue to do that work. All right. Wish we had to cycle water. Yeah. Thank you very much. And thank you for your presentation. We always enjoy hearing all of your information. And I look forward to seeing you in person in July. Okay. We'll see you then. Thank you. <clears throat> okay. Moving on to item number five, our financial status report. Mary, thank you, you very start? much. At the end of May, revenue is over budget by $40,000. The major contributor to this financial variance is golf revenue at 163,000, which is offset by unfavorable revenue variances for recreation of 126,000, bus grants of 26,000, and personal training of 17,000. Total expenses are also under budget by a total of $494,000. The major reasons for these favorable expense variances are unfilled positions of 319,000, water at 137,000, and events and excursions of 112,000. Overall, revenue of 12,415,000 exceeded expenses of $11,739. There is a net positive budget variance, revenue, less expenses of 535,000 through the end of May. And now I'd like to ask Joel Lesser, our CFO, to dive into this a little deeper. Please, Joel. Uh, thank you, Mary. Uh, good morning, everyone. 
So uh, that was a, a great overview of uh, GRF. I'll uh, go over uh, some of the highlights for the trust. Excuse and me, Leanne? Excuse me, Joel? Yes. Dwight, did you have a question? Okay, uh, so the uh, trust estate fund. So we had a, a beginning cash balance of uh, 6,256K. We had additions on, uh, uh, again on a year-to-date basis, so the, for the first five months of the year, of uh, 2,317K. Of that amount, 2,230 are attributable to uh, membership transfer fees. Um, expenditures for the first five months were uh, 1695 k So our ending cash balance uh, for the trust was uh, 6878 k And as far as uh, MOD operations, uh, the, uh, the revenue for the first five months was uh, $4,554,000 with uh, total expenditures of 4281 So we have a year-to-date surplus of $272,000. So uh, during the month uh, of May, there were some uh, work orders that unfortunately didn't get processed. Uh, we are catching up. There were some, um, some new hires that are still in training. Uh, so uh, those work orders are going to be processed uh, in the month of June, which should uh, uh, catch us up in terms of additional revenue. So if we take a look at the, uh, you know, the um, departments of uh, MOD, uh, essentially they're all running at surpluses with the exception of mutual billable or building maintenance. And again, uh, that should be caught up um, in the month of June. Any questions? Okay. Thank okay. you very much, John. Thank you. If you could give us your executive report, please. Yeah, thank you, Leanne. Good morning, board members and residents and staff. So I'm going to start out like I typically do with our latest pandemic update. So what uh, the, there seems to be something that has changed uh, around the pandemic here in Rossmore. It seems that there's more and more activities that people are doing. There's the clubhouses are filling up just a little bit more. Um, there's more more social events. There are of course, all the outdoor activities have continued pretty much for the better part of two years unabated, but it's the indoor activities that we're seeing some, some increase in activity, but, um, which is all good. Um, but what I wanted to talk about was kind of what, what that impact is. And um, I, I want to be really clear to everyone that the pandemic is still here. Um, the, I looked at the county data this morning, and the reported infections at Contra Costa County are just about equal to the infection level right before the vaccines were available in December of, of uh, 2020, so, which is very high. But that's the reported infections. Most infections now are not being reported, so the actual infection rate is probably significantly higher. The, and I mentioned before the, the way to monitor that is uh, the state began monitoring the wastewater collection system in Contra Costa County around uh, late January, and they test it regularly. Uh, their information's on the on the state website, and it shows a dramatic dramatic spike. It's just like a straight up trajectory and it's been that way now since since uh, about mid-April or so. Uh, it, 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 every, every once in a while it looks like there's a slight downturn and then I come in the next day and I see it's gone back up again. So it's, uh, it's it uh, seems to be at a pretty high level and I'm sure many of you know people who are infected. Dwight was was exposed which is why he's not here with us today. And, and he's online, although he, he's been testing negative, he, he has indicated, so which is all good. But it's still out there, so I think it's important that everybody recognize that 
Um, you still need to take steps to keep yourself and your family safe. Um, so this is probably going to be our new normal, is going to be things like this. I keep hoping that this thing will just diminish and, and get out of our lives, but it is not. It's just not on the front pages like it used to be, but it's still there in a really significant way, but we're all kind of adapting to it, maybe resigning to it. So I would uh, continue to recommend that if you are ready to resume indoor activities, or if you're not sure whether to resume indoor activities, or if you have a compromised immune system, then just don't. It's not time then for you. Um, but if you are ready, um, make sure that you're aware that it's still out there and to take whatever steps that are necessary to keep you safe. Uh, the health professionals continue to recommend wearing a mask. Um, they continue to recommend keeping a social distance. Um, the rule of thumb, and it's a state guideline, but it's not magic. It, 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 certainly you could get infected even if you um, are within these guidelines. But the, the guideline still remains six feet distance for no more than 15 minutes. So if you are in a social situation, just keep moving around the room so you're not standing in front of somebody for, for more, than, more than a few minutes. And, and then hopefully, you know, if, if you are indoors, you, you minimize your risk of exposure that way. Um, I wanted to next talk about wildfire mitigation efforts. So as um, the Mayor Pro Tem mentioned and we publicized in the newspaper a few weeks ago, uh, the um, CON Fire, which is the Contra Costa County Fire Protection District, which is our fire agency, they, as the board knows, received a $3.1 million grant. We pushed that grant real hard. We collaborated with CONFIRE to get that grant. We met with all of the elected officials in representing the Rossmore uh, community, uh, the state, our state senator's office, our state assembly member's office, our county supervisor. And we made sure that they were aware that we were in, in support of this grant. Now, this money does not come just to Rossmore. It isn't coming to Rossmore at all. It's coming to the Fire Protection District. And uh, they will spend uh, the $3 million um, over the next, it's probably beginning later this summer or early fall, and then probably into next year. And then it will be up to us to maintain what they call the shaded fuel breaks, which is what they're clearing are these large areas that um, will, will hopefully slow down a fire if there was a fire that developed in, in the wilderness areas surrounding Rossmore. The grant is not just for the Rossmore area, it also it was to support the city of Lafayette and the town of Moraga. Um, however, m nearly all of the monies that are awarded under this grant, it was actually a larger application, but all the monies that they've awarded, just about all of it will be spent on property within the Rossmore area or adjacent to Rossmore. So it will benefit uh, Lafayette and Moraga as well, but it will be pretty much almost exclusively either on Rossmore, GRF or Mutual, or I should say GRF property, or adjacent to GRF property on, on private property. Uh, a couple other things I wanted to note about wildfire mitigation. Uh, one is that um, PG&E has also been busy. They have um, announced uh, three or four weeks ago that they were going to be doing work around the Rossmore substation. Now the substation is that electrical complex that's up at the top of Stanley Dollar Drive. It's not really Stanley Dollar Drive, but it's the street in Lafayette that, that uh, I've, I've forgotten the name of what they call it on the other side of the fence. But, um, but it's literally at the very top of Stanley Dollar. That's the Rossmore substation. It, it provides very little, they tell us, in the way of power to the Rossmore community, but they call this thing the Rossmore substation. But the work that they're going to do is going to support hardening and keeping that particular facility safe, safer from wildfire. So that will be a benefit to all of us here in Rossmore. So I wanted to make sure people were aware of that. Um, and then lastly, well, two more things. Um, the CON Fire and CAL Fire, that's the state fire agency, they collaborated about two months ago on sending a work crew to Rossmore to clear brush under the pg e lines. So they were here about, I think, about two weeks um, doing a lot of work. So you might have seen a fire crew out there, guys in, in yellow um, fire outfits uh, and with uh, axes and saws doing a lot of that work. We featured that in the newspaper when it happened. But these are all important to us, obviously, with fire season upon us. Um, 
And then lastly, uh, Paul Donner tells me that we have completed the disking, the Rossmore disking project, which we do every year. Disking is where you take a kind of a till. You till the grasses and create the fire breaks. Um, large property owners are, are mandated by the county to, um, they've got certain prescriptions that they want um, fire breaks and, and based on how large your parcel is, it will define where, you know, how you should be disking that area. That project is completed. It, uh, I understand it has not yet been inspected by um, the uh, uh, confire folks, but they do. They will come out and inspect the work and they will also then make some further recommendations for GRF and the mutuals. So those are our fire mitigation projects to date. I wanted to address the property tax forgiveness that occurred since we last met. We, we put it in the newspaper on June 15th. Um, so the county tax collector has forgiven all the penalties that were associated with the late filing of the property taxes. And they granted forgiveness based on a medical exemption that the, the California state law provides. So um, it was a medical related issue that, that caused the delay in the payment. And I wanted to uh, remind the board and the community that we have instituted a number of new procedures to ensure that that type of a situation hopefully never happens again. Um, we had a club uh, earlier in the year that received a notice from a law firm that they had used, that the club had used on their website a photograph that infringed on the copyright owner's copyright. So a photographer um, or an agency hired a law firm and they do this as a matter of business. Uh, they, they scour websites for illegal use of copyrighted material, in this case a photograph. So uh, it got ugly, they threatened legal action. Um, the club uh, kind of kept us in the loop as to what was going on. Um, they, the club had some attorneys that were, I guess, as members of the club that helped them navigate this, but had they didn't, if they didn't have an attorney, they would have had to spend quite a bit of money um, uh, responding to the, to the other party, to the other law firm. Had they not responded, they would have been taken to court. So it was settled out of court. Uh, there was a, a cash settlement, um, but the club wanted us, GRF, to know, to let all the other clubs know that this type of thing is out there and that any club that's using photographs or any other printed materials that you don't own or you did not create you are probably in violation of the copyright law. And you might expect a visit by this law firm or other law firms from copyright owners. So just a, a suggestion to all the clubs out there that you make sure that um, all the photographs and any other materials that you have on your websites that you have either permission from the copyright owner or a license to use those images and copyrighted materials. Um, uh, then I wanted to also just make a plug for volunteering in Rossmore. The, um, so, so the clubs in Rossmore are the lifeblood of this community. It's what makes Rossmore fun and interesting. We've got more than 200 clubs here. Sometimes it's as many as 250 clubs. I'm not sure what the current count is. Uh, but there's a, a lot of club activity for virtually anything. And you can create your own club if you find 19 other people that share your interests. And so that happened. We have a lot of clubs that get created every year. Then we have a few clubs that go out of business every year. And the reason usually that clubs go out of business is the lack of volunteers. Um, somebody had a great idea. They had a lot of enthusiasm and energy when they created the idea around the club. But then either they age out or they, they move out. Um, and then the clubs don't have a, su a good succession plan. So the clubs. Golden Rain Foundation and the Mutuals are always looking for good volunteers. So if you have an interest, if you're thinking now that we're kind of maybe coming out of this pandemic, or you're thinking about getting involved because you're saying, I don't care about the pandemic anymore, I want to get on with my life, and you want to get involved in GRF um, governance or mutual governance or, or club activities, please consider volunteering. These clubs need your help. They go out of business because of the lack of volunteers. So um, if we want to keep uh, Rossmore vibrant and active, it depends on people to get involved. 
And I know from what many, many people have told me, I mean, I've volunteered a number of times in lots of different organizations over the years, you usually get a lot more out of it, your activity as a volunteer, than you do just participating. Yeah, it's fun to be a member of a club and to do whatever the club's activities are, but it, it does take special people with it, put a little bit of extra work into it to make volunteering uh, and the activity make it worthwhile, but you will get more out of it than you put into it. So that's my plug for volunteering. The last item here is employee transitions. In May, we had five employees begin employment with Golden Rain. Travis Brainerd, a lifeguard. Uh, Elias Zermeno Escobar, a custodian. Gloria Flores, a senior accountant. Nicholas Storr, uh, works for the building maintenance department. And Daisy Vas Vasquez, who is uh, a new hire at our service order desk up at MOD. We had six employees leave. So every time we feel like we're making some progress, <laughs> take another step back. Six and five began, but six left. Employment with GRF in May. Joe Brzezinski, our IT manager. Mary Hardy, our uh, longtime lifeguard uh, and, and assistant head lifeguard. Tracy Johnson, a bus driver. Adam Morales, a lifeguard. Chris Preminger, our longtime business operations manager. And Jessit Tanales, a utility repair worker, facility maintenance. We had one employee transfer from uh, within a department, but transfer to a different department in, in a larger department, and that's Lisa Cam, who is now our MOD administrative manager. That's my report. Thank you, Tim. Any questions for Tim? Dale? I have a comment, Tim, concerning volunteers. The SERS Club announced this week that they are disbanding because of lack of volunteers for officer positions. So we've lost a long time club. Yeah, that's a shame. I know that, that club has been very active here in Rossmore for a very long time. I just spoke with them last month and they had a good turnout. That's disappointing to hear. Mm, it is. Thank you. Okay, right now we'll move on to the residence forum. Jill? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, we'd like to welcome those residents who've expressed an interest in addressing the board. Uh, those of you that have filled out a form, I'll call you up in order of the, the uh, time that I received your form. Let's start with Judy Nixon. And when you come, please state your name and your address. And you have three minutes to address the board. Residents have up to three minutes to address the board. The board does not directly answer questions posed by speakers during the residents forum, but it does hear the viewpoints and ideas presented and directors do consider them as they act during the meeting. Speakers must conduct themselves with proper decorum consistent with community standards that would not be offensive to a reasonable person, as determined at the sole discretion of the GRF board. Participants may not engage in personal attacks, obscene gestures, lewd acts, shouting, profanity, threats of any kind, acts of physical violence or other disruptive behavior. Speakers violating these rules may be expelled from the meeting and precluded from speaking at future meetings as determined by the board. In-person forum instructions. Complete the residence forum slip and then give your slip to the board secretary. Copies of handouts or notes should also be given to the board secretary. Zoom forum instructions. If you wish to address the board, use the raise hand feature or press star nine if connecting via phone audio only. Residents are welcome to type their comment in the Q&A chat feature located on the control panel of Zoom at the start of the meeting and up until the start of the residents forum. Please wait your turn and once unmuted, state your full name and Rossmore address. Once the residence forum has begun, additional resident comments will not be considered. Okay, thank you, Judy. Good morning. My name is Judy Nixon. I live at 2816 Tice Creek Drive, number eight, entry three. My late husband and I chose this manor 21 years ago because it was overlooking the golf course, the beautiful hills, and was such a peaceful setting. Of course, we witnessed the development of the event center and were concerned that we would be looking at a huge parking lot, but not too worried about sound issues. 
Lots of redwood trees were planted at the request of the neighborhood, and they eventually hid the glaring lights and parking lot. Everyone is very grateful for that. Now the board is considering putting a large number of pickleball courts behind the event center next to the golf course. Tice Creek entries one through five would be very much affected by the WAP noise all day long, seven days a week, and I do know how loud that sound can be. I and my neighbors are very concerned it will destroy our peaceful setting, as you have already determined it would do so at the hillside complex. Surely members of this board can imagine how the noise game how the noisy game would affect functions like weddings, anniversary parties, memorial services, dollar patio events, dollar picnic grounds, and of course the swimming pool occupants. Even with the proposed sound walls, I doubt one can hear what another person says. A sound study, and not a hugely expensive one, definitely needs to be done before any other expenses are incurred. We were promised a fair evaluation of all the sites. I agree that the pickleball club deserves a place for them to play, just as Ross Moore has provided the huge tennis court complex since I've lived here, the bocce ball courts, the lawn bowling, and so forth. But I and my neighborhood and many Ross Moorans I have spoken to do not believe this is the right location. Please consider this location. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Um, now call Louise Dibble. Good morning. Um, okay, we're good. Thanks. <laughs> uh, my name is Louise Dibble. I live at 2840 Tice Creek Drive, apartment seven. And I'm here again to talk about sound and how it travels, at least in entries uh, three and five and probably four. Um, I think Judy has covered many of the points really well, and I do hope that you consider them. But also, I want to talk about how the sound moves in our entry. And it's because of the structure of the hillside moving up, and also because entry four building, uh, G11 buildings form a sort of a solid wall. So, for example, when, when the um, gardeners are driving the um, lawn mowers on the golf course, now we can hear that on the golf course, and if we're on the back of our apartments, we can hear that mower going on the golf course. That's not a problem. If we go out onto the front of our apartment and then listen, what happens is that sound bounces off the G11 building, and then we can hear it as though it were coming from the west side. So we hear sound on the east side, we hear sound on the west side. Now I'm thinking that if pickleball is playing on our east side, we can hear it from all directions. It will be 3D sound in entry three and five, and entry four will hear it as well. So I hope that your sound study precedes any decision about locating the pickleball courts, and, and I think especially um, considering that pickleball does deserve its own spot, but it deserves a spot which will not adversely affect the living conditions and the, be and the comfort of the residents who have been here and will come here um, eventually and want to enjoy peace, quiet, and a lovely environment. And I thank you very much. Thank you, Louise. Uh, Wendy, Wendy Raggio. Hi, 
Hi, I'm Wendy Raggio. I live at 2836 Tice Creek, number two, on a little U-shaped road between entries three and five. I've lived here for five years. And I came today with Louise and Judy, and forgive me, we didn't compare notes, and I think I have some repetition that I'm going to subject you to. Uh, many of the residences at Tice Creek Entries 1 through 5 back up to or face the east. We are located on a rise above the event center, 18th Hole and Green, and Dollar Complex. We also view the hills beyond. The setting is truly peaceful and natural, but also is filled with sound from below, residents and visitors conversations, music from weddings, parties and performances at the Dollar House surrounds, and of course the golfers golfing. Good noise. We're in a kind of amphitheater setting. That said, I'm here today because I'm concerned about the kind of noise that will be generated at six newly proposed pickleball courts. Their location would be to the east in a small area directly below our homes between the 18th hole and the event center. I attended the last Zoom planning meeting on June 23rd. Three of my neighbors spoke, setting their perceived negatives of this close by court site. I've read the planning committee's most recent documents and proposals. I've seen the suggested locations dwindled from four to three to two. Now the focus seems to be on only the event center option. By this time in the decision-making process, I had expected to be able to view decibel level impact comparison research for each location being considered. Instead, today's GFR Board of Directors meeting agenda under 9B2, the Planning Committee report, consider authorizing agreement with Jet Landscape for completion of design, et cetera, prepared by Jeff Matheson. It appears to be the ask for a green light to move forward with the event center site. Attached are around 40 pages of event center design and construction related proposals from Jet Landscape Architecture and Design et al. at a cost of close to- You have 30 to, seconds. Close to $200,000. A separate proposal from Acoustics Group covers event center noise related analysis and recommendations and totals. And my point, I won't read the rest, I don't have time, is that, um, we would like the consideration of a sound report before any further negotiations go forward with construction and design. Thank you for letting me talk. Thank you, Wendy. Uh, call Fran Gibson. Good morning, I'm Fran Gibson. I live at 4503 Terra Granada Drive, 3B. I'm Fran Gibson, president of the Rossmore Emergency Preparedness Organization. We are celebrating our 30th year here in the Rossmore community with a two-pronged goal or mission statement. One is to help prepare our neighbors for a disaster and emergency that might occur here in Rossmore. And the second part of that uh, core mission is to help organize our neighbors should a shelter in place order be given by civil authorities. That is Rossmore's core mission and we are devoted to it. Those goals include everybody in Rossmore, everybody, every resident here having a grab and go bag ready at the ready should a mandatory evacuation out of one of our eight zones, evacuation zones be ordered and also to have two weeks worth of shelter in place supplies should a shelter in place order be given and we cannot leave out the main gate to go fetch those supplies. So if you're within earshot of me, you're a resident, please know that it is your sole responsibility to get yourself organized and prepared for a disaster or emergency that may come our way here in Tice Valley. I want to commend Mr. O'Keefe on his words this morning about volunteering, and I'm here to say a few things. My graduate training and my, public, my experience, professional experience is in public health, 
And so I went to the internet to pull out some reasons why it's good in our age cohort to become volunteers as seniors. Uh, senior volunteering improves our quality of life. It enlarges our social networks. It actually decreases blood pressure. It lowers mortality and morbidity in general. It reduces disability measures across our age cohort. It lowers our dementia risks. It reduces, um, it improves cognitive health and grants us better overall neuroplasticity. Whenever in our age cohort as seniors we're learning something new, and I certainly have experienced this as serving as president of Rossmore EPO for two and a half years, I've learned a lot of new stuff and it's helped, certainly helped my cognitive ability. So volunteering is a is a win-win-win. It's a win for you as a senior. It's a win for you our have 30 seconds. clubs and organizations. I encourage everyone. We have 277 entries across our 1,800 acres here in Rossmore. Rossmore EPO needs your help in helping prepare your neighbors. Thank you for consideration of your comments, and I want to thank the staff members and board members for all that you do to encourage the safety, the resilience, and the well-being of our vulnerable senior community. EPO and our EPO family thanks you. Thank you. And thank you, Fran. I will call Lynn Carruthers. Brothers, 3152 Tice Creek Drive. Good morning to you, Golden Rain Foundation members. And first, thank you, Dwight Walker, yeah. for encouraging me to bring my concerns about the accidents on Tice Creek Drive to the board. Much has happened since I saw you all last month's, during last month's residence forum. First off, Becky Smith, whose May accident you will recall inspired Neighbors for Safer Streets, is healing. After a dozen surgeries, all kinds of staples and tubes, Betty is, Becky is on the road to recovery in a transitional care facility in Walnut Creek. Next up, rehab at John Muir, and in the near future, back home to Rossmore. Our first Neighbors for Safer Streets rally was a success, and I'm grateful and want to thank Tom Cashin for his thoughtful and generous guidance. To our residents who taped hundreds of flyers to trash enclosures, and made dozens of posters, and turned out those two intersections on June 7th. And the coverage in the Rossmore News was fantastic, thanks to Sam and Ann and Dan. Since the rally, neighbors have contacted me to share their stories about their close calls and accidents on Tice Creek Drive over the years, to tell me that their personal awareness has changed. I'm now paying attention to how drive, fast I drive. I hadn't really appreciated that the speed limit really is 25 miles here. I am a responsible adult, a woman said to me the other day, and now I know I've been driving too fast. I've also received several emails with people wondering, is it my imagination or are people driving slower since the rally? I've submitted an application to make Neighbors for Safer Streets an official Rossmore organization. A second rally is in the works. I do hope you will attend and interest from residents all over the valley to get involved and be part of the solution is swelling. I'm not really sure about that verb. Yesterday's Rossmore News mentioned the unanimous approval from the planning committee for the Tice Creek Pedestrian Safety Project. Tom has created this comprehensive, forward-thinking plan which will, without a doubt, and with our residents' support, have a positive impact on our driving habits and safety on Tice Creek Drive. I do hope you all today will also unanimously approve that plan. Neighbors for Safer Streets, working with dedicated people like Tom and the board, will make a difference here in Rossmore. I'll see you next month. <laughs> Thank you, Lynn. Uh, that uh, concludes the residents in person who wish to address the board. Are there any uh, Zoom comments? Yes, uh, we do have seven individuals on Zoom. I'm going to begin first with a submitted written report by Suzanne Wong, who lives at 4167 Terra Granada Drive, number 2A. I learned to play pickleball in the old Sierra room. I served for five years on the Rossmore Pickleball Board 
and I currently mentor any resident who wishes to learn this game. I am excited that we may soon have a pickleball facility. Like you, I have kept informed about the many proposed locations for a permanent pickleball facility. Though it feels like it has taken forever to designate a pickleball location, I sincerely appreciate the time and detailed research conducted. Thank you for being so diligent. Today, you will be discussing three options for a permanent pickleball facility, which includes Buckeye, Creekside, and an unused piece of land near the 18th hole of our dollar golf course. I hope you will vote in favor of the unused land. My reasons. The unused land near hole 18 is located adjacent to existing amenities, including drinking water, restrooms, parking, and a picnic area. This is a cost advantage. Placing solar panels over event center parking will obstruct the impressive view of Rossmore's historic dollar house. Installation of solar panels over the six pickleball courts instead is a simple answer to provide both shade for players and create an expansive surface for solar panels. Another cost advantage. A wall with some landscaping on the golf course side would address concern about errant golf balls, views, and pickleball sounds for residents who live near hole 18. Rossmore is known for many well-designed projects, including but not limited to the event center, Creekside Complex, and the Tice Creek Gym. I hope our pickleball facility will be included in that list. Thank you for making hard decisions to benefit our community. Okay, that concludes Suzanne Wong's. Next up, we have handle name Joseph Painter. Joseph, please state your full name, Rossmore address, and you have three minutes to address the board. Joseph, you should see a blue button in front of you to unmute yourself. Okay, I think it's unmuted now. There you go. Thank you. Um, I'd be there in person, but I couldn't. I'm babysitting my grandson in San Francisco. And I'm... I live at 2832 Tice Creek Drive, number one, entry three. And several of my neighbors have sent you thoughtful and some heartfelt emails regarding the, our concerns about the pickleball courts at uh, proposed pickleball courts at the event center. Three of my neighbors spoke with you in person today. We've talked about we're, that we're very worried about the noise, the loss in value to our homes, the removal of some of the tallest redwood trees that border that form a border between the golf course and the event center parking lot, light pollution the courts would bring, noise permeating the dollar house, pool, and park area. We all came to Rossmore for the peace and serenity it offers. Those of us who moved to my neighborhood, especially those of us who line the golf course, never imagined a noisy pickleball complex in our backyard. The dollar complex is on the other side of our canyon. The pickleball club only represents about 5% of the Rossmore population. There are about 200 clubs in Rossmore. Some of them have functions in Dollar House and Park, which would be altered by pickleball noise so close by. Last week, I gave you an example. Last Tuesday evening, the Interfaith Council Group had a music and singing performance in the Dollar Garden. Pickleball noise nearby would have been a distraction. There are memorials, weddings, and parties at Dollar House and music performances in Dollar Park. Tai Chi and meditation groups have met there. Could these activities exist in the same way with pickleball noise in the background? Six courts and 24 players playing at one time will get very noisy. A few nets could easily be set up now and players could volley and whack balls into the nets. I'd welcome each of you to my home to assess the noise and I know many of my neighbors from entries one through five would as well. The noise should also be assessed from dollar house, park and pool areas. We do believe you owe that to the community. The residents know the ramifications pickleball noise would give us. Others in the Rossmore community won't know the noise ramifications it would have on them until it's too late. They're not focused on it as we are. The plans were published in the newspaper, but unless residents are paying close attention and connecting the dots, they don't realize how close this location is to the dollar house. You have 30 seconds. They're not grasping the reality of the grasping the gravity of pickleball noise so close by as we are. Nearly $200,000 is a big investment to step away from. Before making that investment, we ask that you work with the acoustic engineer 
who could give the board some idea of costs and design requirements to mitigate the sound. Thank you. Thank you for listening today. Thank you. Next, we have Christine Kearney. Christine, I am unmuting you. Please state your full name and Rossmore address. Good morning. My name is Christine Kearney, and I have been a Rossmore resident for eight years. I live at 2840 Tice Creek Drive, apartment four in entry three. I represent myself and my neighbors in entries one through five. Our neighborhood is 300 feet away, the length of one football field from the convergence of the 18th dollar, the 18th green of the dollar golf course and the event center and the dollar mansion area and a proposed pickleball facility. The planning committee last week voted to proceed with a sound study of how noise from an open air pickleball facility near the event center would affect our peaceful neighborhood. The sound study alone would cost only $8,800 plus some extras. But the committee also added a preliminary design and construction documents for proposed pickleball facility. This adds $161,000 to the sound study, totaling a hugely expensive proposal of almost $200,000. The proposal was presented as a way for the sound engineer and the architect to work together to pick materials to minimize the pickleball noise from this proposed site. But $200,000 for $8,800, the sound engineer should be able to use previous data and give the board some idea of costs and design requirements to mitigate the noise. This expensive proposal certainly seems like a way to railroad the event center as the site for the new pickleball facility without ever having a discussion about the merits of each and every location within Rossmore. Once the board has spent this huge amount of $200,000, they are not gonna to want to abandon the plan and choose another location. The board would never walk away from a $200,000 investment. I strongly object to spending $200,000 on this combined proposal. Rossmore residents were promised a fair evaluation of all of the sites and the noise impact of each site to the residents before any decision is made. Thus, I request the proposal of $8,800 alone for the acoustics group to do the sound study at the event center and to not approve the additional $161,000 proposal from Jet Landscape Design. You have 30 Both seconds. Sites have yet been decided upon. Thank you for your time and your consideration. Thank you. Next, we have Rosemary O'Neill. Rosemary, please state your full name, Rossmore address. Good morning. My name is Rosemary O'Neill. I live at 2840 Tice Creek Drive, number six in entry three. Thank you for hearing me. I am representing myself, my neighbor, Carla Witte, who could not attend today, and all my neighbors on Tice Creek Drive entries one through five. Firstly, I would like to encourage you, strongly encourage you to take the acoustics group sound study and complete your sound study and not the proposal from Jet Landscape Design, which would be very costly. So I hope that you will take the um, acoustic group sound study. I'd like to say that the proposed event center pickleball courts will gravely affect myself and my neighbors in entries one through five. It will be a permanent disruption to the fabric of our neighborhood forever, not to mention the removal of our gorgeous precious redwood trees. We bought our properties here, as many of as my friends have stated already, for the peacefulness and the natural wonder, the natural view and landscape. Not only would it permanently change our neighborhood, the proposed courts would greatly reduce the event center parking spaces, creating parking mayhem 
for all Rossmore residents who attend the event center. Finally, this location would adversely impact the many celebrations, weddings, memorials, family gatherings, and Stanley Dollar Estate throughout the year. Kindly reconsider this location. The pickle, I believe it, you know, I'm, I support the pickleball club. They need to have their own exclusive building and location where they can play pickleball without upsetting surrounding neighbors and habitats. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Next, we have Marsha McLean. Marsha, please state your full name, Rossmore address. I, I'm sorry, this is Marsha McLean. I didn't really want to speak. I was just complaining that I didn't hear the sound at the beginning. Thank you. Oh, certainly. Thank you. Next up, we have Bob Kelso. Bob, please state your full name and Rossmore address. You have three minutes. Good morning, Bob Kelso, 2836 Tice Creek Drive, number one. Thanks for your time serving Rossmore. I'm gonna add my voice to the discussion about pickleball at the event center. I urge you to select the proposal from Acoustics Group Inc. and not the proposal from Jet Landscaping. As others have said, investing $190,000 in a study, including construction drawings, means you've chosen the event center site without ever having the full discussion of all sites as promised. No board is gonna walk away from $190,000 investment. The acoustics group study should be able to predict using previous pickleball sound studies and recordings, what noises will emanate from the courts and what materials and construction would be needed to mitigate the sound. It may be very well possible that the mitigating sound at this site will be much more difficult than expected and therefore more expensive. We were promised a thorough review and comparison of all sites and we can't get that if the board invests $190,000 in the JET study. And I'd like to reiterate several points I've made in previous letters. Folks in this neighborhood, Tice Creek Drive entries one through five, purchased homes with no courts to impact their daily lives. Folks around Buckeye and Creekside bought homes near tennis or pickleball courts and probably paid a little less because of that. Unless you can totally mitigate all pickleball noises, this is an unfair imposition on an entire neighborhood. Please put yourself in our position when evaluating the sites. Also, the cost of rehabbing the Creekside site, which is included in the Creekside estimate, but not in the estimates for Buckeye and the event center sites, must be included in the cost estimates for Buckeye and event center sites, since it has to be done no matter what. And that would give a fair apples to apples comparison. Thank you. Thank you. And lastly, we have Ken Anderson. Ken, you have, please state your full name, Rossmore address, and you have three minutes. Yes, I'm Ken Anderson. I live at 1100 Oakmont Drive, number four. Uh, two issues I want to talk about. The first, first, I'll just mention that I think it's a tremendous uh, or necessary compromise to put pickleball at the event center. Uh, all things considered, I think it's a, it's a very good compromise, mostly because it does not take something away from an existing uh, club. The second issue I want to talk about is that um, the Rossmore News is finding it hard to uh, get people to hire people to deliver the paper door to door. Uh, later this morning, you will be considering seven options on delivering the Rossmore News. Three that would keep door-to-door -door service and four that would not. I want to uh, strongly recommend that all three options that would keep door-to-door -door policy uh, delivery. Um, the Rossborn News is just too important not to guarantee it to every door. It informs us about all things going on in Rossmore, including news, governance, residents' communications with each other club news, entertainment, travel, and more. It would be hard for some residents to walk any distance to get a paper from a delivery box, especially if they can't be sure a paper will be there when, when they get there. 
Some would not because of the weather, too hot, uh, too cold, or rainy. Others, also, if the Rossmore News cannot deliver, guarantee delivery to over 6,000 households, it could lose approximately 50% of its advertising revenue. Thank you and appreciate your time. You are also volunteers. Thank you. That concludes the resident forum. Thank you to all. Thank you to all the residents uh, for your comments. The board will consider them. Okay. At this time, we're going to move on to our um, excuse me, our resident member committee reports. Um, so I'd ask uh, Merrick Lipson if you could come up and give us a report on audit. Good morning. <clears throat> the audit committee met on June 14th, and I'll briefly summarize what we covered. Uh, we dealt with two responsibilities that are <clears throat> set forth in our charter. Uh, first, the committee uh, considered the performance, the independence, and the cost of the GRF's external independent audit firm, CBiz SLD. Um, the uh, firm recently completed its uh, audit of GRF 2021 financials. It also has audited the 401k and pension plans and has provided tax services. At our meeting, uh, CFO Joel Lesser uh, noted that CBIS SLD uh, has been professional and responsive and that has worked well with the staff uh, in completing its, its work. Um, com Controller uh, Amanda Davis uh, told us that uh, she could confirm uh, that the auditors have been good to work with um, and that they provided um, more uh, analytical tools now that they've been acquired by CBIS last year. Uh, she noted that the main audit manager is going to be leaving the firm, which means that if the GRF continues to engage the services of this firm, they'll be getting a new audit manager. Um, CFO, I'm sorry, CEO uh, Tim O'Keefe noted that that's potentially a positive development in that uh, a new manager would bring a fresh perspective to the work. After discussion, uh, the committee members and uh, management uh, agreed and concurred that uh, CBIS SLD has provided excellent performance. Now, this is the last year of a three-year commitment that we have uh, from this uh, external audit firm. And the next thing the committee had to do was to consider whether to recommend retention of the same firm or to recommend commencing a search process for another firm to do this work. Um, based on the strong performance that we've observed from CBIS SLD, uh, the committee unanimously recommends uh, that the uh, GRF continue to engage the services of this firm and uh, it recommends to the board that it authorize negotiations uh, to continue uh, its work as our external auditor. Um, in addition to this, uh, we also received a status report from CFO Joel Lesser on the uh, successful resolution of the uh, property tax penalties. Um, and he described the control improvements uh, that should help avoid any recurrence. Uh, in addition, he reviewed some uh, organizational changes uh, that have been made to the finance department, which should improve the accuracy, uh, efficiency, and, and provide a better backup for the future. 
Finally, we reviewed a proposed change to the Audit Committee's charter simply to reflect the uh, GRF's new term limit uh, policy for resident committees. And we unanimously approved the new language and we recommend it uh, to the policy committee and to the board. Our next meeting will be in September when we will uh, be review reviewing the uh, draft results of the latest audit of the 401k and pension plans. Uh, do you have any questions for me? Any questions for Merrick? If not, thank you very much. Tim has a question. Not a question. I, this is Merrick's last meeting as the chair of the audit committee. And uh, I know that uh, I talked about volunteering earlier in the meeting. And um, Merrick is one of those people who got volunteered for the job by, by, and was, was pushed into both joining the audit committee and then becoming the chair. And I know that he kind of didn't want to do either of those things, but I want to commend him for doing that, stepping in. And, and really doing an absolutely outstanding job as the chair of the audit committee. You've really took the committee to a different level. And I know that our staff, our accounting staff, our CFO, our controller have all uh, appreciated your diligence, your attention to detail, your commitment to the community and doing things right. So um, I want to thank you for your service. Uh, thank you. And Merrick, before you leave the podium, this is Dwight Walker. Dwight. Uh, uh, can you hear me okay? So, uh, Merrick, you have provided strong stewardship to the audit committee for the past five years, for so the last two years as chair, and I'll accept responsibility for pushing you into both of those things. Uh, the committee's role and responsibilities have been clarified through your efforts, and the board thanks you for your dedication and professionalism. It is my hope that you will continue to offer your counsel to the committee in the upcoming year as they transition to new leadership we wish you all the best, and Leanne would like to present you with a certificate of appreciation. Thank you very much, Mary. Thank you. Really appreciate your professionalism. Thank you very much. I simply want to say that it's been an honor to support this board, the employees of the GRF, and the residents of Frostmore. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we'll hear from Bill Dorban with the Finance Committee. Actually, you could probably hear me without the microphone, but uh, thank you. Um, the Finance Committee met last Tuesday, and we have four recommendations. They're contained in items one through four of your agenda. And uh, the first item involves um, the approval of the MOD refund to be distributed to the managed mutuals on a per unit basis. And for that, I'd like to uh, call upon CFO Joel Lesser to describe what it is uh, w that we are um, uh, recommending for approval. Uh, you'll find the details, the financial details on attachment 8B1-1 in your packet, 8B1-1. Joel? Thank you, Bill. Um, I have my glasses on here. So I just wanted to go over the uh, methodology with the recommendation for the uh, MOD um, uh, surplus refund. So the 2021 uh, total surplus uh, is one million sixty four thousand four yes yeah that's the wrong that's the wrong uh, uh, transparency up there could you take that off please thank you go ahead oh. okay um, so the total uh, 2021 MOD surplus which would uh, is one million sixty four thousand four hundred and eleven dollars uh, but that is going to be subject to, uh, you know, necessary cash reserves for um, for operating MOD. So, uh, in, uh, so uh, how we came up with the recommenda recommendation as, as far as the amount to be refunded is we began with the cash balance at May 31st, 
2022, which was $809,963. We're adding the receivable from the county for the um, for the forgiven for property tax penalties of six hundred twenty thousand forty one dollars so the total available funds from a cash perspective is one million four hundred thirty thousand and four dollars so we need to set aside five hundred thousand dollars for for essentially cash operating activities so MOD has a budget, <clears throat> a monthly budget of approximately $900,000. So 500,000 is about 55% of that, which should be adequate. So if we take the $1,430,000 and $4 and subtract 500,000, uh, we get a, uh, an amount of $930,004. And that is the recommendation uh, to the board. It amounts to $146 per manor. And then the, uh, the schedule details how that allocates to each of the mutuals. Um, however, uh, the, uh, the Waterford Mutual 58 uh, does not participate in the, uh, uh, the services of an MOD, so uh, that mutual is not included in the allocation. Any, any questions? Mary? I would like to make a motion that the GRF board approve the MOD refund totaling $930,004 at the rate of $146 per manor. Is there a second? I second. second. Any discussion? Uh, Deborah, roll call, please. Certainly. Walker? Yes. Hamaji? Yes. Ali? Yes. Hurt? Yes. Bentley? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Meehan? Yes. And Topper? Yes. Unanimous. Okay, thank you. Moving on to item 8B2, Bill? Thank you. Um, before we do that, uh, I'd like to just mention to uh, the people that are uh, tuning in on Zoom or whatever that the details as to uh, how much each mutual will be expecting from that is contained in the packet and materials, which is also available through Simbly. So if you go to Simbly, you look up uh, 8B1-1, and your percentage there will be the numbers that are indicated for um, uh, your particular mutual. Okay, uh, moving on. 8B2 is to approve the budget calendar for 2022-2023. Uh, that information is also in the board packet. Uh, the committee re recommends that that uh, uh, calendar be approved by the board. Okay, Mary? I move that we accept the Golden Rain Foundation 2022-23 budget calendar beginning in June 2022 and ending on September 29, 2022 with the board approved budget. Okay. Any second? Second. Ted. Ted second. Okay. All, any discussion? All in favor, or I'm sorry, Deborah, please do a roll call. Certainly. Walker? Yes. Hamachi? Yes. Ali? Yes. Hurt? Yes. Bentley? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Meehan? Yes. And Topper? Yes. It's unanimous. Okay, now we're going to move on to item 8B3, um, the budget principles. Bill. Thank you. Uh, the committee has reviewed and recommend that the um, Budget, uh, the budget principles for 2023, the operating uh, budget principles for 2023 be adopted by the board. Okay, Mary? I move that Golden Rain Foundation Board approved the uh, operating budget principles as described in the packet. Okay, a second? Second. I'm sorry, did you say that? Jill, thank you. Any discussion? Deborah, roll call. Certainly. Walker? Yes. Hamachi? Yes. Allie? Yes. Hurt? Yes. Bentley? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Harrington? Yes. 
Meehan? Yes. And Topper? Yes. It's unanimous. Okay, thank you. Um, now we move on to item 8B4, um, discussion of the 2021 operating fund surplus. Thank you. Um, you can now display it, please. Uh, display 8B44. It's up. On the screen. All right. Uh, last, thank you. Uh, last month, the uh, Finance Committee reported uh, uh, that there were several open issues that were, we were dealing with, uh, questions that we didn't have answers to in particular, relating to the 2021 GRF operating fund surplus. That amount was 3881000 and change, 382875 to be exact. We did research and developed a uh, more accurate idea of how much cash would be available for distribution, what items had already been allocated either by board action or by uh, decisions that the board was intending to make, we believed, uh, and also uh, some of the activity that involved uh, refunding or, excuse me, uh, transferring funds to um, MOD for COVID losses. So some of the money that was available initially of the 3,882 uh, was used in the 2020 2022 budget discussions, which uh, uh, reduced the coupon for 2022. And that was done in September of, uh, of last year. The board used those to keep the coupon down from an, about an 8% increase to about a 6%, just a little bit less than a 6% increase. You can see on the screen that the coupon rounding, the TV, the cable TV rate increase offset, and the addition to the trust maintenance reserve, those three items were uses of that surplus for purposes of controlling and keeping down the reserve, excuse me, the coupon amount that was uh, to be requested from the mutuals on a regular basis every, every month. That amount was $538,463 of coupon reduction. So that, uh, so that was done. In addition to that, there was a surplus amount that was applied to MOD COVID-19 losses. Part of the losses that uh, we received some of the money from, from, from uh, uh, the PPP program, were to be allocated to activities, uh, em uh, employment activities and, and salaries and things uh, at MOD. So MOD's surplus was increased by 383,000. That way we saw that that number then was passed through through the MOD activity and uh, the uh, distribution uh, that they, uh, that was just approved for them. That left 2,961,412 of unallocated and unused surplus of the 388, uh, 3,882,000. We're now down to 2,961,000. Uh, the recommendation of the committee was as follows, that the allocation to an internal audit for 2023, which was already approved by this board last month, I believe, uh, be uh, allocated for that purpose. Keep in mind that if uh, we don't do the allocation now, it's only going to be addressed as an addition to the possible addition to the coupon in 2023 in any event. Second item that we were recommending be included now in a uh, allocation is for the new property management and accounting system. Uh, there is, has been conveyed to, to us that there is a sense of urgency about getting this done and getting this allocated now. Um, it may or may not be a 2023 expenditure, but um, uh, we felt that the board had, uh, the sense of the board was that uh, you wanted that uh, to be included, so we did as part of our recommendation. The third item that we had previously recommended, which involved wildfire mitigation, of 120, 
five thousand dollars, whatever it was, uh, is is something that is probably not going to be uh, needed this year, and can be part of the adjustments and and uh, uh, discussions in the budget for 2023. Uh, which leaves the amount of proposed distribution to the mutuals of $2,711,412. I want to mention one other thing while I'm, I'm on the subject. This is to all of the mutuals on a per unit basis. Uh, this distribution that's recommended is in addition to the MOD distribution numbers that we just talked about, with the exception of Waterford. Uh, Mutual 58, which is not included in the MOD, but certainly is included with the um, uh, the rest of the mutuals for operating fund purposes. Are there any questions? Yeah, Bill, I have a question. I might have missed this, but just to clarify, the 140,000 for the allocation to, for the new property management accounting system, that's for a consultant, is that correct? Yes. To investigate a future system. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Any other questions? Uh, Madam President, I'd like to uh, make a motion that the GRF board pr approve the proposed distribution for the mutuals from the 2021 GRF operating fund per surplus as recommended by the Finance Committee. Okay. Is there Tim? You should indicate the amount, the dollar amount. Thank you, Tim. In the amount of two million seven hundred and eleven dollars and four two million seven hundred eleven thousand four hundred and twelve dollars. Thank you. I second. Thank you, Dale. Discussion. Deborah, I have, I have roll call. Question. I have a oh, question. I'm sorry, Bill. Is it appropriate in that same motion to uh, indicate the allocation so that the entire amount of the three million eight eighty two is accounted for? I don't know if we need to. Okay, if we don't need to, that's fine. I just okay. No discussion. Deborah, roll call. Certainly, Walker. Yes. Hamaji. Yes. Allie. Yes. Hurt. Yes. Bentley. Yes. Clarity. Yes. Harrington. Yes. Meehan. Yes. And Topper. Yes. Unanimous. Okay. Thank you. That's my report. Thank you. Dwight, did you want to say something? Yeah, Bill, don't leave the podium yet uh, because <laughs> uh, I have something to say. You know, I moved to Rossmore six years ago. One of the first people I met was Bill Dorban. And uh, it wasn't long until uh, he recruited me to be on the Mutual 68 Finance Committee when he was treasurer of, of that board. Uh, I've had the pleasure of working with Bill the past three years with him as chair of the Finance Committee. Bill has demonstrated outstanding leadership in conducting efficient and effective meetings. He's been a, a, a mainstay of recruiting qualified residents to work on many committees and even on the board. Uh, and he has a deep, deep understanding of the financial operations of Rossmore. And uh, Bill, you're to be commended for that. Bill, you're going to be met, missed on the finance committee, but your legacy lives on in the example you provided after serving seven years on the Finance Committee in the last three years of chair. And so thank you very much. And Leanne has a certificate of our appreciation for your service to the community. Thank you. Thank you. I, especially to, I especially want to thank you for your help with the facilities master plan and the budgeting around that. And the planning committee greatly appreciates your help. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay, we will move ahead to item 8C, uh, Golf Advisory, John McDonnell. John? John is not present. John, are you on Zoom? Yes, I am on Zoom. Can you hear okay. me now? Okay. Okay, well, um, I wanted to uh, present the, uh, the last Golf Advisory Committee report that I will uh, uh, for today. Um, so I want to just take a moment and thank Dwight and the board uh, for their confidence in letting me uh, be the chair of that Gulf Advisory Committee for those many years. I'd also like to take a moment and thank just the rest of the members of that committee. Uh, Mike Wiener, uh, who is at large and the current vice chair, Sarah Buer, 
was from the uh, Rossmore Niners Golf Club, Pat Iacola from the Rossmore Men's Golf Club, Kirk Close of the Hackers, uh, Robin Morrow of the 18ers, uh, Teddy Swanson at large, and a uh, special thanks to our GRF liaison, uh, Ted Bentley, and uh, Dwight and the whole board. Um, the only thing I'd point out in our uh, report is that golf continues to have healthy participation. Uh, revenues are continuing to uh, increase, even though we had a good year last year. Uh, the superintendent's report will indicate that our water management uh, in Rossmore is considered to be a model by the um, East Bay Municipal um, District. And uh, he, there is a note in uh, this month's report from the superintendent uh, regarding that and our continued efforts to um, uh, manage our water. Uh, so that's all I would have to say for today. So thank you very much. Thank you, John. Dwight, did you want to? Have oh, yeah, John, before you leave Zoom, <laughs> first of all, please, please pass along to Blake our thanks for his uh, diligent managing of that East Bay mud water usage. That's really important. Hey, John, all good things have to come to an end, I guess. Uh, but I must say that you go out on a high note with the way that golf is operating. Uh, your professionalism and chairing the golf advisory committee was good for the various golf clubs and you did an excellent job of keeping the board informed about, about the needs of golfers the civility and gentlemanly ways in which you conducted yourself made us all want to be a part of your golfing golfing foursome so if you're looking for some partners uh, <laughs> sign us up uh, leanne would like to present you and i guess we'll do it virtually at this point with a certificate of appreciation from the board for your service to the Rossmore community. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. Sir. I appreciate you and the board. Okay, at this time, we'd like to take a five minute break. Uh, we will return at uh, 1131. 1031. 1031. I'm sorry? 10. <laughs> that would be a very long break. present okay okay we're gonna we are going to resume with the board committee reports uh, we will start with item excuse me Leanne if I could just make a comment oh I'm sorry sure um, I, I wanted residents to know and the board to be reminded especially the, those that are especially those that are new to the board um, so we you've just heard from three very long tenured committee chairs that have just left their chair positions. Uh, this is the natural evolution of the term limits that the board adopted a couple years ago. So each of those committee chairs have served GRF for a very, very long time. Um, Merrick for really only a couple of years, but both John, the golf chair, and Bill, the finance chair, were both on those committees and uh, in Bill's case, um, or I should say in John's case, he was the um, golf chair when I was hired back in 2015. So, both, but Bill and John both were on those committees um, going back even before I have been involved here. So, uh, so this is not a bad thing. Uh, we're sad to miss in, in the institutional knowledge and really their professionalism has all been exemplary, all of them. Um, but there's opportunities then for the next generation of leaders here in Rossmore to step in for, for GRF's governance and step up to be committee chairs and get involved in various committees. So when GRF adopted the term limits, the whole idea was to bring in more and more residents to get involved at, at the committee level to hopefully then um, have people rise to become involved in the GRF uh, board level at some point. So we just wanted to provide that, that that's not a, they're not all just mass leaving, it's because their terms had ended and uh, the next generation are stepping in. And we'll talk more about the appointments, I think, later in the meeting today. Correct. Okay, I'd like to welcome Eric Wong, who's gonna talk to us about, um, poli uh, excuse me, compensation.
if I could introduce you, Eric War. Um, the committee met on June 21st via Zoom. We discussed issues related to employee recruitment and retention and looked at how our current compensation and benefits package stacks up uh, when compared to the Bay Area's inflation gauge. Uh, now I'd like to ask Eric, uh, the Senior Manager for Human Resources, to provide an overview of our discussions and the three recommendations the committee is proposing for board review and approval. Eric. Thank you, Jill, and good morning, everyone. Uh, when we met as a committee, we talked about staff uh, wages and uh, increases for the 2023 calendar year. Um, I have three uh, recommendations that I want to be able to bring to the board today for your approval. The first is on the base wage increase. Um, we, uh, as a committee, uh, determined that the index that we would want to use, again, um, we've done this since 2017, is the consumer price index for urban, urban consumers for the San Francisco Bay Area. That provides for consistency of what we've done and, and also a reasonable metric to be able to provide that increase. So uh, historically, we've used the numbers uh, ending with the month of April, and that came in at 5%. So the recommendation from the committee is the 5% increase, increase to, to base, wedge, base wages for uh, uh, GRF staff in 2023. I just want to make a note, too, that that's uh, to add to the budget. And it also, it goes hand in hand with performance evaluations at the end of the year that increases are based on also being able to meet performance standards as well. So the motion is to uh, approve so, a base wage increase of 5% based on the CPIU in April. I have a second. I'll second the motion. Mary, second. Any discussion or questions for her? Is that, is, is is that number the number we always use, or is that flexible based on recommendations from staff? The number changes uh, uh, every year based on what the number uh, is determined at the end of April. So the CPIU, uh, well, all the CPIUs, they have them, and we use the one for the San Francisco Bay Area since it's relevant to us. That comes out every other month. So the one that we use uh, generally is at the end of April, which gives us time to be able to put that into the budget for the next year as we enter into the budget season. And, and that number does change does, each year. And do we have the right to change it, or is it written in stone? Like, is it always going to be that 5%, or is that? Well, the number is discussed within the Compensation Committee okay. and then brought to the board, and then the board can discuss and deliberate on that. Tim? So the CPIU that ends April every year uh, changes. It's, it's always a different number. So this year, for April of 2022, it was 5%. For April of 21, it was 3.8%. For April of 2020, it was 1.1%. Um, the board, except for the 2020 uh, CPIU that, that affected the 2021 budget, 1.1% was the CPIU, but the board elected to provide no increase to the staff that year. So there was a 0% increase for staff. All the other years since 2017, when the board, first the compensation committee, then the board um, settled on using the CPI as, as their metric to establish the, the base wage adjustment, it, it removed the subjectivity, which in the years prior, it was just whoever, somebody would say, let's make it this. With, with no basis in anything. So which wasn't really fair to the residents, wasn't fair to the staff. This seems to have taken that equation and, and kind of made it fair. Um, so next year, the CPIU for April of 23 will be some other number, probably not 5%. It would be something different. OK, we have a motion on the floor. Deborah, could you take roll, please? Of course. Walker? Yes. Hamachi? Yes. Allie? Yes. Hurt? Yes. Bentley? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Meehan? <laughs> yes. And Topper? Yes. It's unanimous. Uh, the second uh, topic that we talked about was uh, uh, the committee has proposed a merit market adjustment pool in the amount of $125,000 to be established in the 2023 budget for non-represented employees. The 
merit market adjustment pool is used for two things. One, it's for the, the use to reward or recognize employees for exemplary performance for things that they've done throughout the year. The other reason for the merit market pool is to provide an amount for adjustments that need to be made to wages. So for example, um, uh, different positions we have. We have about 80 positions here at uh, Golden Rain Foundation, and so periodically those need to be reviewed compared to the market to see if there's been any movement. So any increases with that needs to be factored and are put within this pool so we can make those adjustments if need be. Thank you. So the recommendation, the second recommendation the committee is making is that the board uh, approve up to $125,000 for a merit market wage pool for 2023. Is there a second? That's a motion. I'll second. Okay, Mary. Any discussion? Questions? Deborah? Up, oh, Tim? So I should provide a little insight to this too. So in addition to what uh, Eric has said, the, the reason that the board back in 2017 uh, agreed to establish first a merit pool and then separately a market pool, and then a, about three years ago, I think they combined them to make a single pool. They, so we call it the merit market pool. The idea is that your high performers in an organization drive the performance of the organization, and you want to encourage people to do that. You want to encourage especially those that have the initiative, the creativity, the putting in the extra hour and time and thought into their work. It, it's the concept of a rising tide floats all boats. So when you have high performers that, that really either drag or push everybody else around them to, to perform at a higher level, it, it improves the performance for the department or the, or the organization. So uh, the board back in 2016 we didn't have a tool like that. And there was no, no way to reward high performers. And we were concerned that we would be losing high performers. They would go find work elsewhere because other places pay you bonuses and pay better wages and so on and so forth. So the board recognized that, that it would be a, of a benefit. At first, the compensation committee made the recommendation. The board agreed. And every year since, the board has agreed to, to do, set aside some funds for the merit market pool. Um, many years, in fact, all years, except for last one, last year, um, we don't end up spending all the money. Uh, the, the senior staff make the recommendations for um, the merit adjustments. The market adjustments are determined by the HR department, by Eric when he does some analyses and um, determines whether or not somebody has dropped through the bottom of their pay band, and we use that pool to help catch them back up. So they're at least at the bottom of the pay band. You don't want to lose a good employee um, because our pay isn't competitive. So every year, Eric does an analysis of, of a number of positions. Can't, we don't have the capacity to do all of the positions every year. But when a position leaves, when an employee leaves, that's every employee that leaves. When we hire a new person, every one of those, he's, he recalculates what the band should be. We've got some tools that help him do that. So that's what the merit market pool is, um, and uh, the committee is recommending the 125,000. Okay, thank you for that. Any other questions? Deborah, roll call. Certainly, Walker. Yes. Romati. Yes. Valley. Yes. Hurt. Yes. Bentley. Yes. Flaherty. Yes. Harrington. Yes. Meehan. Yes. And Topper. Yes. It's unanimous. The third topic we talked about was CEO compensation, which is related to the topic of pay, uh, but a different line item because the CEO works under a contract, which is different from the rest of all the other employees at GRF. But the recommendation and the proposal for a CEO is uh, for base wages to increase by 5%, which is equivalent to $14,400, and it's um, in line with the percentage using the CPIU. Um, that we're using, the same amount that we're using to make base wage adjustments for all other employees. Okay, we have a motion to then approve the uh, committee's recommendation of a 5% increase in CEO wages. I'll second. Okay, thank you, Mary. Discussion? Okay, Deborah, roll call, please. Certainly, Walker? Yes. Hamachi? Yes. 
Alley? Yes. Hurt? Yes. Bentley? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Meehan? Yes. And Topper? Yes. It's unanimous. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Eric, very much. Um, we'll now move on to item 9B, uh, the planning committee. And as chair of that committee, I'm going to waive my introduction and just ask Jeff to speak about the facilities master plan. Great. Thank you. Good morning. Attached in your packet is the final facilities master plan as recommended by the planning committee during their last meeting. The process for review and adopting the master plan is to introduce it today and then we'll bring this back at your July meeting for consideration of adoption. So I'll be uh, brief in my comments today. The facilities master plan uh, was approved a little over a year ago and we have been engaged with the firm of ELS uh, architecture and urban design uh, to develop this plan. It has involved significant community outreach through two workshops, some focus groups, uh, meetings with the planning committee, the finance committee, and the GRF board. Through this process, uh, in, in addition to doing outreach to other communities and evaluating current trends and evaluating our existing facilities, through this process, uh, ELS has come up with a number of proposed projects uh, and the plan tries to capture all of those projects and processes, whether or not those projects move forward. So we try to accomplish a few things within the master plan uh, document. One is to document the process that we went through, complete the evaluation of existing facilities, highlight all of the projects that were identified as potential, narrow that down then into the projects that the planning committee and board and uh, funding has been identified to proceed with. And then the most valuable tool is the development of the funding model, which is a spreadsheet contained in the master plan. That spreadsheet has several variables that both the finance committee, planning committee, and ultimately the board can use to evaluate things like increases to the membership transfer fee uh, or overall budget and expenditures for the trust estate fund, including the ongoing uh, maintenance type items, uh, payments for the three outstanding loans, uh, as, as well as uh, revenue projections. On an annual basis, the uh, Planning Committee, Finance Committee, and the Board can evaluate that spreadsheet and make adjustments to accomplish the list of projects that are identified. If you look at that right now, the main project that is identified over a 10-year window is completion of renovation of the MOD office complex. The other projects are really broken into a Three categories. We have immediate need, which uh, in, in, includes some of the projects that are currently approved, such as the pickleball, uh, looking at uh, ADA improvements to uh, dollar, to the exterior of dollar, uh, doing some uh, consideration of the fire exit, emergency exit, and so forth. The other identified projects are under what is called a pipeline. So the planning committee recommended a number of projects be listed as pipeline. These are projects uh, such as water reclamation, uh, gateway renovation of the, the multi-purpose rooms. These are projects that could be brought on as the plan rolls forward. So every year, the plan will roll forward a year new projects can be added or moved or considered. The next category then is wish list projects. These are projects that were identified through the study, but at this point wouldn't be considered unless new funding was identified or priorities change at some point. But they're still kept for uh, history and for purposes of bringing those forward in the event that there are resources. Finally, through the process, the, the board or the committee, 
Planning Committee eliminated several projects, such as a playground, uh, a miniature golf uh, facility, and so forth. So those were actually, even though they're in the report, those were removed from consideration in the spreadsheet. Again, this is a, a plan that will be updated on an annual basis during the budget cycle for the trust estate fund. Uh, it is a plan that should be flexible and a tool for evaluating uh, any adjustments to the membership transfer fee and revenue, as well as consideration of future projects. If there's any questions at this point regarding the introduction of this, be happy to answer. Again, this will be brought back for uh, a little bit more in-depth analysis in your consideration of adoption in your July meeting. Any questions for Jeff? Well, I want to thank you and Joel tremendously for all the help that you've given the planning committee and our board for getting through this process. It was almost a year and um, it was very involved and I learned a tremendous amount from both of you and I want to thank you both for that. Um, since this is something that we've um, brought to the residents along the way, um, I am suggesting that we do a um, straw vote today to uh, consider a town hall meeting to present this final document to the public. So um, I understand with a straw vote, we don't have to take a roll call. Is that correct, Deborah? It's helpful for me for recording purposes. Okay, we will do that. Um, could you take a straw poll vote as to um, holding, uh, presenting the final facilities master plan to residents? Of course, so Walker, how do you yeah, vote? Yeah, yes, with the proviso that that town hall meeting happened before the board officially approves it. Oh, correct. Okay, and Hamaji? Yes. Allie? <clears throat> yes. Hurt? Yes. Bentley? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Meehan? Yes. And Topper? Yes. Thank you. Okay, uh, we will move on to item 9B2. Um, regarding the uh, potential pickleball site at Event Center. Jeff. Okay, thank you. This is a project that the planning committee and board and community have been working on for uh, at least the past year plus. Uh, the analysis has been going on with the club for many, many years. The planning committee and the board have engaged in a detailed analysis of numerous sites throughout Rossmore. And there are very few that sites that are um, available to uh, complete the uh, complex of at least uh, four courts. The desired courts are eight. Uh, every site has different variables that uh, have been considered from sound to parking to proximity to the creek to other environmental factors such as uh, the oak trees um, and, and so forth. In the last meeting of the planning committee, we reviewed the three sites that are currently under consideration being the existing Creekside location, the Buckeye location, and the event center site. The event center site was first introduced uh, during the June meeting, excuse me, the May meeting, and then again during the June meeting. We also reviewed the sound study for the Buckeye site that was completed several months ago. The recommendation at this point from planning is to proceed with the event center site with a recommendation to uh, execute an agreement with Jet Landscape and the acoustics group to develop the site plan and the construction documents and complete a sound study. There has been several comments about why not do the sound study first and then proceed with the jet landscape uh, agreement. Having both the landscape architect and the uh, acoustics uh, group work together, collaborate together, 
will provide us the opportunity to have their work uh, done in a collaborative manner. We can analyze what different orientations, what different materials, what different um, options are, and then how those impact the overall design, the site, the lighting, the trees, the sound, and so forth. Uh, eventually, what we'll do is come back to the planning committee and the board based on the sound study, based on how that impacts the design, and have the planning committee and then the board approve that design before proceeding. So just because the board at this point is authorizing an agreement that has a value up to 100 and about 165,000 with jet landscaping does not mean that you are authorizing or writing a check to jet landscape for $165,000. What it does is, is allows us to work together with acoustics group and jet landscape but if we come back to you and the community and the solutions that are uh, derived do not meet the interest uh, or do not uh, mitigate the sound or the lighting or other uh, aspects, the board can pull the plug on that site and no further funds would be expended. So before we proceed to development of construction documents, go out to bid or any of that, we would come back to you with the design and the results of the acoustic study. So it, there is great value in having those two uh, consultants work together at this point, especially since it's not an existing site that we're studying for sound. Um, and you would not be expending all of the funds up front. So there, there is certainly potential that if we don't proceed, there would be significant funds left over that hadn't been expended yet. The event center site does have some uh, significant benefits. It is located near existing parking that would be adequate. Uh, certainly there may be times when that parking lot is full with the events, but for the most part, there is adequate parking. There are restroom facilities available in close proximity to the site. There are picnic uh, areas located near the site. Um, there is no conflict with existing facilities such as Buckeye. Uh, the main benefit, however, is that we are pursuing a solar phase two project, which would involve solar canopies at the event center location. Uh, currently, they are carport canopies. We would use those resources and combine those uh, two projects such that the canopy would be moved to a canopy over the pickleball courts uh, and, and thus save on uh, resources by combining those. Is there any questions at this point that I'm missing? Maxine? any of that funding be used uh, to help pay for the sound study and all consideration? So the, it will not be used to pay for the sound study or the work by jet landscaping. Uh, what it will involve is the solar canopy will be actually designed and constructed by solar technologies who we will have an agreement with for the solar phase two and that is then funded through uh, the power purchase agreement that has been developed. Uh, so resources that are dedicated to kind of the carport canopies through that PPA would be applied towards constructing that as a, a canopy over the um, pickleball courts. Okay. Um, yes, Carol. Um, uh, Jeff, you said that what we're contemplating is a $160,000 contract with Jet Landscape. Um, but I think we're also adding on the acoustics group to that. So we're contemplating 190,000, is that correct? That's correct. You would authorize agreements uh, totaling uh, 190,058, which includes a, a contingency in order to complete the study by the acoustics group as well as initiate the uh, jet landscape uh, work. Again, 
if we pull the plug at some point with the jet landscape work, those funds would not be expended. Thank you. Any other questions? Leanne, if I could ask a question. Sure. So Jeff, uh, I don't like your term pulling the plug, but an exit ramp perhaps. Uh, what, where do you think that exit ramp, first exit ramp might be, and how much do you think we would expend to get to that first exit ramp on this project? So I don't have an exact dollar figure, but it would be in uh, the completion of the design. Uh, we would come back to planning and the, the board. So we would definitely expend the resources on the sound study, and there would be some effort with jet landscaping and incorporating any recommendations, making adjustments to the design to accommodate different building solutions, and then coming back. Uh, so the amount that would be expended during the design phase, I, I don't have an estimate of that, but we would try and make that as minimal as possible and, and bring back at an early stage. And just to follow up, do we need the design elements to in order to get city preliminary review? So we want to have some pretty pretty good schematics in order to get start the uh, city review. Uh, the initial city review would involve the the drainage that may be needed, parking analysis, accessibility, and so forth. We would not submit. Uh, plans at this early stage yet for uh, evaluation of you know the overall project or constructability thank you any other discussion do we have a motion oh, carol yeah. i move that the board authorize the ceo to execute agreements with Jet Landscape Architecture and Design and Acoustics Group for design documents related to a pickleball complex near the event center. The fee agreement shall not exceed $190,058 and shall be paid from the trust estate fund. Thank you, Carol. Is there a second? I'll second. Mary? Further discussion? Deborah, can you do a roll call, please? Certainly. Walker? Yes. Hamachi? Yes. Ali? Yes. Hart? Yes. Bentley? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Meehan? Yes. And Topper? Yes. Unanimous. Okay, thank you. At this time, I'd like to ask um, Tom Cashin to speak to us about the Tice Creek Speed Safety Project. Good morning, board. Thank you for having me. Um, so I'm here to talk about the, the Tice Creek Pedestrian Safety Project for 2022. Um, just to kind of clarify, um, normally we do this at the end of the year or the beginning of the year to talk about our capital budget as part of capital budget. However, with the uh, tragic events, uh, Becky Smith and Kurt Gunn, uh, I just did not want to wait any longer, and neither did the community. So um, that's the reason why I'm coming to you mid-year um, to ask for uh, funding this project and your approval. Um, so to give you a little bit of background, since you already have a lot of it in your your uh, your packet there, I kind of wanted to show you a couple slides so you can visualize what I'm talking about in the packet um, to help you understand, as well as people who are watching uh, can understand what I'm trying to do on Tice Creek. Um, first off, before we start, uh, since these are photos taken from the internet and based on CEO Tim O'Keefe's message, uh, I was advised these are legal to show. Uh, so <laughs> hopefully we're good. If I'm wrong, my name is Paul Donner. <laughs> so first off, six solar radar readers is what we're going to put up. You've seen these through our community. We currently have about four to five of them in our community. Um, we use a portable one right now on Tice Creek. Um, it's stationed there all the time now. Um, and I want to install a total of six permanent ones in there, three for the northbound lane and three for the southbound lane. They're solar powered. Um, and as you can see, they look similar to this picture. And then we'll be installing 18 crosswalk signs. These are those high fluorescent ones. These are the new ones that you see. 
Um, we have some of these already installed in other safety um, crosswalks uh, throughout the valley, and they'll have the arrow as well. There are a couple uh, current crosswalks on Tice Creek that are not the ladder style, which is a, uh, a higher visibility. Um, so we're going to replace those two with a ladder crosswalk. And then also we'll be installing these shark teeth. Um, this is a, a correct term. Uh, they're more triangles, but they call them shark teeth. And so those will be installed prior to the crosswalks. And they are a requirement per the vehicle code that a vehicle has to stop um, at those shark teeth, not up at the crosswalk. So it gives both the pedestrian some more room, some safety room, as well as uh, the vehicle, uh, it alerts the vehicle of the crosswalk coming up. And you can also see in this picture the fluorescent uh, pedestrian sign with the arrow as well. Okay, then uh, we're also gonna be doing red curve evaluations along Tice Creek in the intersections and at the crosswalks. Um, there is a requirement for crosswalks to have a minimum of 15 feet of red curb. Um, however, uh, speaking to the city, um, they prefer to have a lot more than 15 feet. Um, their, their, their suggestion is anywhere up to 50 feet. So uh, as you can see uh, in this one, you can see the, the red curb around the crosswalk. So we'll do an evaluation of all of Tice Creek and uh, make sure that we're complying with what the city is recommending to us. And I already covered that. Okay, any questions? Yes, still. Um, Tom, uh, we're accustomed to, when we have to stop, of stopping at a uh, a, 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 vert, a horizontal line. And so I'm wondering if we shouldn't, in addition to the shark's teeth, if we shouldn't have a horizontal line just at the top of the shark's teeth as sort of a reminder to people that that's the line. So you, you could either do one or the other. You So what we do is we follow the MTUCD, which is a um, guidance from the federal, as a federal guidance of signage and stuff like that. And so you use one or the other. Um, the city has um, transferred to using the shark teeth over the limit line kind of thing that you're talking about. And so we wanted to be in line with what the city's doing. Um, so that's the reason why we were gonna do well, the shark I, teeth. I, I, I'm talking about having both. Yeah, um, the advisement is we do one or the other is what the city said. Well, we're gonna have some issues of we already have challenges with educating people i yeah okay we'll just do some demonstrations <laughs> maxine i don't know if this has to be in the plan or not but can you talk a little bit about whether or not there are plans for increased enforcement since we know with all good intention people don't always pay attention. Yeah, that's a really good point. So whenever you're talking about traffic safety, there is the standard three E's. It's education, enforcement, and engineering. So this plan here is specifically, we're talking about engineering. We're doing some engineering work on the roadway. Now, as far as enforcement, uh, the Walnut Creek Police Department has been very responsive to my request to come on out, as well as they do it on their own. They're very familiar with what's happened on Tice Creek. They've investigate, they investigate all the injury accidents that happen on Tice Creek. Um, unfortunately, they do have an issue right now. They are um, severely understaffed. Um, about 10 years ago, they had a total of 10 motorcycle officers and a sergeant. Now they have two motorcycle officers. So they're really trying to hire and get back up to that, that staffing level that they used to be at, um, but it's gonna take some time. Obviously in the future, I do, I'm exploring some plans to partner with them, uh, where GRF partners with the Walnut Creek Police Department to actually have an officer be here uh, 40 hours a week. So hopefully we'll be able to do that down the line, but this would not cover that right now uh, as far as enforcement. Thank you. Ted? I'd like to make a motion to uh, could I uh, ask a question before? Sure, you sure. Go ahead, Karen. Um, I just wondered: Did you see the letter in the Rossmore News 
this week. Um, I should have cut it out and brought it, but a woman uh, wrote about all of the, she wrote about the location of the crosswalks, whether they're on the north or the south side, and she said that people coming down will make a left turn crossing over the crosswalk. And if the crosswalk was on that side, um, it, would, it would make it safer for pedestrians. And the same with people coming down Tice Creek who will be turning up to you know, Running Springs and those other roads, um, that if the crosswalk was on the other side of the street, it would be safer. Um, I know I presented that in a confusing way, but I thought it was an interesting statement from her, and I wonder if you had a comment on it, if you saw it. Um, unfortunately, I have not read the paper yet. Um, I've been a little busy, but uh, I am familiar with that. I actually had a conversation with one of our residents yesterday about that same topic, and um, I agree. Mm -hmm. I think it would make it safer. Mm -hmm. Anytime you can uh, minimize a pedestrian versus vehicle conflict, which that is, is whenever a vehicle is going over a crosswalk, um, the safer that street will be. So what I did do is I reached out to um, our streets, uh, lack of a better term, supervisor, engineer, and I shared with him that during our next um, paving project that we move in doing that. So usually when we do a paving project, we look at the street and we go, what are the latest, greatest ways to make it safer? And then we implement them at that time. Um, just so you know, it's not so, it's not so easy to move a crosswalk and do a crosswalk. Everybody thinks we can just go out there with some white paint and do that. No, this is a special thermoplastic material that we use nowadays because that is the latest greatest safety for crosswalks because of the visibility especially at night and so those are expensive and you actually have to a lot of times when you move it we have to make sure the city's okay with the lining of it and the engineering of it um, so we, there's a there's a lot more to it it's not just painting over the old one with black and then you know taking white paint and doing some lines sure. thank you any other questions Jill? Yeah. Um, has anyone ever observed whether uh, drivers do react when they come towards one of those radar screen, uh, one of those signs that tells you how fast you're going to see whether or not they put their foot on the brake or anything else? Because there are going to be six more of these if we approve it. And I'm just curious, has anyone ever? Yeah, there, there have been some studies that show they do work. Now, is it going to work 100% of the time? No. No, I mean, clearly we see it ourselves. Sometimes you see someone drive by and they don't slow down, you know. However, there are some that do. There's a quite a big number that do. And the more we reinforce the speed here and remind people, I think earlier Lynn was talking about someone who says, oh, I didn't realize it was 25 miles an hour. Um, so the more things that we can use to advise people when they're going over the speed, I, I think that's the better. Are we going to get everybody? No. But if I could slow down a, a good number, then it's worth it. Thank you. Okay, Ted, you had a question? Uh, I'd like to make a motion. Oh, okay. A mo uh, um, motion to approve the Tice Creek Speed uh, Safety Project as recommended by the Planning Committee for the amount of $92,879. I second it. Okay, thank you. And Deborah, roll call. May I ask you to second the motion? I think it was Mary. No, it was Neva. Oh, Neva. I'm sorry, Neva. Thank you so much. And for roll call, Walker? Yes. Hamaji? Yes. Ali? Yes. Hurt? Yes. Bentley? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Meehan? Yes. And Topper? Yes. It's unanimous. Yo! Huh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Oh, now we'd like to welcome Ann Peterson here to talk about our Rossmore News staffing shortage. Thank you, Leanne. So I've talked with the board in the past about some of the challenges that we've faced at the Rossmore News with trying to keep our news carriers employed. Uh, 
It's not exactly the most glamorous position. It's physically draining for the carriers to have to do this. They're barely paid above minimum wage, and they're only working one day a week. And so as a result, I remember when I started here in late 2018, we had 22 news carriers on staff. Today we have 12. So that just illustrates how difficult it's been to get and keep our news carriers. This year has been really challenging. We have had six open routes. That is the equivalent of about 75 entries here in Rossmore. So we've had to get very creative to get that paper on the doorstep. We've always guaranteed delivery by 5 p.m. We've been missing that regularly uh, with a few entries because of our vacancies. We've also had to use our full-time, regular, and part-time staff rolling newspapers for two-plus hours every Wednesday just so we can get the papers in the hands of the carriers. Our videographers over at Rossmore Television have also been doing deliveries for us, and they make a lot more money than the news carriers do, so it's starting to take a hit on my budget. The other thing that we're facing now is that we are straining our regular news carriers because they're having to pick up so many extra papers. I actually had one carrier this year at the beginning of this month quit because he was just exhausted. So we've got to be very careful. I can't afford to lose anybody else. 12 really is the absolute limit that I can go. I go any lower, I'm in trouble. We really can't get the paper out. So last week, we went to the planning committee with seven options, things we could look at uh, in terms of trying to deal with our staffing shortage. Here's the irony. Since that meeting a week ago, I now have three news carriers in the pipeline, possibly ready to start in the next couple of weeks. So Leanne and I talked, and what I'd like to now do is defer this presentation until the end of July, because it may not nece be necessary. That said, I do want to look at two possible near-term solutions, things that I think could help us out right away. The first one would be to increase our pay from 16 an hour to 18 to 19 an hour. We are having a very difficult time competing with the Uber, Lyfts, and DoorDashes. Deliverers can go over there and make much more money. And so a lot of newspaper deliverers are going that direction. If I can increase our hourly rate, then we would be able to compete better for these job candidates. And more importantly, I can get our regular staff back to actually producing the paper, which is what we really need to be doing. If we were to do this, we're looking at just under $12,000 to just under $18,000 more a year. But again, keep in mind, I'm paying regular staff right now a lot more to do the job of what these carriers are doing. The second near term, third near term, if I can get it, there we go, um, would be to split the deliveries between Wednesday and Thursday. I want to emphasize this is just an emergency move. If these new hires work out, if we don't fall below 12, we're fine and we would never have to do this. I'm basically just asking the board to authorize us to be able to do it in case we do fall below those 12 news carriers, which would put us in a position not to be able to do all of the deliveries on a Wednesday. So this would just be an emergency measure. Again, this I believe would be enough to tide us over, and then next month we could see how things are standing and redo the rest of the presentation to talk about the other options. I appreciate your consideration. Okay. Madam Question. President. Dale? I move approving two near-term options immediately. One, increase the news carrier wages to $19 per hour, and two, allow for deliveries on Wednesday and Thursday if news carrier staffing numbers fall below 12, and then to defer discussion of the long-term options to the July meeting. Okay. I need I have a question about that. Oh. Um, I think she said 18 to 19. Does that make a difference in the motion? Did you want a range? No, it's not going to make addition. If, if you're willing to, to do 19, my motion would is certainly 19. make it easier. We need to recruit and keep people. Ted. Second. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? Deborah, roll call, please. Certainly. Walker? Yes. Hamachi? Yes. Ali? Yes. Hurt? Yes. Bentley? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Meehan? Yes. And Topper? 
Yes. Thank it's you. Unanimous. Okay. Thank you very much, Anne. Moving on to item 9C, uh, the policy committee. Um, Dale, did you want to present that to us? Yes, thank you. Um, I'm not going to, I don't have anything to report on because we have four items that are coming up okay. uh, for consideration. So when you're ready, we can move into those. Yep, we're ready. So the first one, uh, uh, th three of the four are first readings. So we won't be voting on, on, the, on three of the four. The first one is procedure 103.0, and it defines the use of electronic petitions and newspaper postcard um, inserts as an additional method of petitioning for candidates in conjunction with the door-to-door -door petitioning. So that is for, obviously it's for GRF board positions. You want me to move to the second one? Yes, please. So that, just to reiterate, that's a first reading today. Yes, that's okay. correct. That's the first reading. The, one, uh, the second first reading today is Rule <clears throat> R118.0, Smoking Restrictions. This rule applies to all persons <clears throat> while on GRF property to include open spaces, outdoor recreation facilities, parks, <coughs> trails, and all other outdoor GRF owned properties. And again, this is the first reading. Um, the next item <clears throat> is actually an item to be voted on and that's the Civility Task Force Charter. And the charter is, is in the materials here. Um, and it's to improve positivity and civility in Rossmore. And Leanne, if you wanted to add anything on this, that would be, um, that would be great. I don't really feel like I need to add anything any, to this at this time, uh, but I'm thankful to the policy committee for approving the charter. And I wondered if there were any questions about that. No, okay. Do we, uh, uh, Neva, you I have, have a motion? motion. Uh, I move that the board approves the charter for the civility task force as it appears in your packet. Uh, with a term of six months and a group comport, composed of both board members and residents. I okay. second. Okay, Dale seconds. And I just want to announce that Ted Bentley has agreed to chair that committee. So thank you very much for thank you very your much. willingness to wow. head that very important ch All right. charter. Uh, Dale, were you going to address? Um, yeah, I have a last one. Okay. Rule <laughs> R. 117. Oh, uh, excuse me, we didn't do a roll call on that. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. Uh, Deborah, could you do a roll call for the Civility Task Force? Of course, and I do want to remind <clears throat> that there is one additional item that maybe I didn't catch was the Berm Park item. Yeah, well, he's going to do that next. Oh, thank you so much. So, roll call is Walker? Yes. Hamachi? Yes. Ali? Yes. Hurt? Yes. Bentley? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Meehan? Yes. And Topper? Yes. Unanimous. Okay. Yeah, I, uh, I thank you, Deborah. I apologize. I overlooked the first item uh, on the agenda under policy. I mean, yeah, under policy. And that is to um, consider a recommendation from the policy committee to rename Berm Park and to solicit ideas from the community. Okay, so that's going to involve the Rossmore News and putting right. a solicitation. So if we, there. if we approve this, it, it kicks into, and maybe Ann has some comments, but we are seeking input from the residents and from the community in the process of coming to a name 
So, Ann, could you help us if out? If the board approves it today, we would start running a notice in the July 13th paper. It would run for three weeks, and then we would bring back all of the recommendation, recommended names to the policy committee in August. Perfect. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions? Maxine? No, I was going to move. I have a question. I noticed in the write-up that it suggested once the names have, the suggested names have been put forward, that the survey would be conducted by Survey Monkey. I think that's an online process. Correct. And I know we have many people in Rossmore who are not online. So would there be an additional way to I think do Anne that? wants to address that. We'd conduct that the same way we do all of our surveys. So it would be on Survey Monkey, but we would also print it in the newspaper, and then they bring it into us, and we just input it into Survey Monkey for the overall number. Thank you. Okay, Maxine, you had a question? No, I'm, I would like to you make have a, a motion? motion. Okay. I would like to move that we rename Burn Park and do so through solicitation of name ideas and input from our residents and community. Okay. Thank you very much. And a second? I'll second. Okay, Mary. And Deborah, please do a roll call. Certainly. Walker? Yes. Hamachi? <coughs> yes. Allie? Yes. Hurt? Yes. Bentley? Yes. Flaherty? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Meehan? Yes. And Topper? Yes. Unanimous. Okay, and the final item is also a first reading, and it's Rule R117.0, Cooking and General Open Flame Restrictions on GRF Property During Red Flag Warning Periods. Um, the prohibited use of open flame grilling on GRF property during red flag warning days is to help prevent wildfires in Rossmore. And this again will come back to us next month uh, after I, this first reading. I was under the understanding it's a second reading today. Oh, this yes. is the second reading? The second reading, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, so wow. we'll, we'll need to discuss that further. Any okay. It, um, it it indicated on the on the agenda here first reading. Um, so that's okay. It's it, it's saying right here under number under um, policy number three. Oh, I'm sorry. Under ten unfinished business. Yeah, we've moved into. Item oh, I'm 11. sorry. I'm um, number ten. Y yes. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Um, is Tom still here? Does anybody have any questions for Tom on this topic? No. Okay. <laughs> that was easy. Um, do we have a motion? Ted? Uh, I'd like to make a motion to approve Rule 117.0, Cooking and General Open Flame Restrictions on GRF Property During Red Flag Warning Periods as recommended by the policy committee. All right, thank you. Anybody second? Second. Dale, thank you. Deborah, roll call. Oh, I'm sorry, discussion? I have one question for Tom. How, what is the plan for enforcing this? Well, poor Tom has to run all the way down. Price is right. Um, <laughs> yeah, so during red flag warning days, um, we will have, uh, Dale brought this up um, a while ago about having a sandwich board out at the uh, barbecue areas of Shady Glen Park. Um, and then what will happen is uh, Securitas will be doing their rounds on red flag warning days of those barbecued areas to make sure that no one does barbecue. Okay. Well, will they have the, uh, the right the, to, in fact, if someone's there, misusing the policy to to get them to go away or stop? I mean, do they have that ability? Um, so they, they don't have a legal ability to, like, make an arrest, um, but there are ramifications if they refuse to stop. Okay. Um, so it, even up to the point where um, trespassing can be invoked, okay. and then the Walnut Creek Police Department can come on out, and then they can enforce the law. Thank you, Tom. Yep. Good question, Mary. Yeah, Ted. <clears throat> would this also be, uh, would there also be that same kind of signage at Dollar on the day that there's a red flag? 
Yes, I believe we're going to purchase two sign boards, and I believe uh, REC is going to be the ones who are going to actually put them out. And then Securitas will be doing the uh, rounds to enforce it. Yes, because there are fixed barbecue pits uh, at Dollar way in the back right. near the golf course. So those are included. If you look at the wording um, in this rule, it, it uh, takes everything. Plus, it also would cover individuals privately taking their barbecues from their manor and if they chose to go out into a park it applies to them as well correct all of grf property it applies to yeah um and one other thing it does apply to is if for some reason a peacock hall i mean peacock plaza um every once in a while they do some barbecue lunches out there it would impact them as well on red flag warnings fortunately um you know, it, it, we, we don't have a lot of red flag warnings, but when they do, we have to be extra, extra cautious, and that's throughout the whole valley. So that's what this policy or rule is to help. Very good. Thank you. Oh, oh, Jill? Sorry. I know the no smoking um, ordinance doesn't apply to the golf course. On red flag warning days, is there any reason smoking should be prohibited on the golf courses? So the smoking policy is actually mimicking the City of Walnut Creek ordinance. And so it really, we just mimicked all that they did. And they were, they were moot to that, um, to be quite honest. And they're actually um, don't have any restrictions on barbecuing on red flag warning days either. Um, so we'd have to look into that. Yeah, it's a, yeah, it's a good point, though. It is a really good point. Mm -hmm. Yeah, One of yeah. the valuable things that uh, Nixle provides is notice to all the residents when it's a red flag day, and it's such as don't drive too much, stay inside. Perhaps it could include a reminder, no barbecuing or smoking outside, so that it's there to remind people. Yeah, absolutely, and that's what um, I, I run the Nixle, so yeah, that's exactly what I'll be doing. Yeah. Okay, any other questions or comments? I, I don't fully understand um, the rules about barbecuing in backyards how does that affect so um that's a little different um so there's there's many like overlaying laws here the states passed a law which prohibited like barbecuing on balconies and things like that um and so they really um govern the mutuals and then the mutuals pass their own rules and regulations that might be even more restrictive so that that covers that and then really my responsibility is all grf property so that's how that works yeah and we don't we don't have authority to tell the mutuals what to do so it's up to them to develop their own policies yes yeah. absolutely correct okay all right thank Deborah, you could you do a roll call please Certainly. Walker? Yes. Hamaji? Yes. Valley? Yes. Pert? Yes. Bentley? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Meehan? Yes. And Topper? Yes. Unanimous. Okay, we're going to move on to new business, item 11. Um, 11A and 11B, in the interest of time, have been deferred. Uh, the presentation from New Front Retirement Services will be deferred to our July board meeting. And the Securitas contract renewal item, since it's not pending at this very moment, will be deferred to the August meeting. Um, so then we will move on to 11C, which is uh, considering the um, uh, member committee appointments by our president, D Dwight Walker. And Dwight, did you wanna start that? Sure, thank you. So as Tim mentioned in his remarks, and, and we've heard a couple times here today that uh, you know Rossmore benefits a lot from uh, the contributions of volunteers, whether it's to clubs and organizations, but it's also true for GRF resident advisory committees. We're very fortunate that this go around, 18 people who stepped forward to volunteer their efforts but for only nine openings. That makes it a very difficult process, but we really appreciate everyone who uh, stepped up and said, hey, I wanna be a part of this, and we hope that you can find a way to get involved if you were not uh, selected to be on these committees at this point in time. So uh, with that, um, 
Are there any questions about the committee appointments? Oh, okay. I would like to make a motion. Um, I move that the board approves the resident member committee appointments as presented in the packet. And is there a second? I'll second. Okay, Mary. Any further discussion? Okay. Um, in addition, Dwight would like to present the chair positions, correct? Leanne, I think we need a vote. Oh, I'm sorry. Okay, Deborah, can we do a roll call? Certainly. Walker? Yes. Hamaji? Yes. Ali? Yes. Hurt? Yes. Bentley? Yes. Clarity? Yes. Harrington? Yes. Meehan? Yes. And Topper? Yes. It's unanimous. Okay. Thank you. And Dwight, did you want to announce the chair positions? Yes, but before I do that, I, there's one person that we didn't uh, get to thank, and I don't think she's been in the audience today. Maybe Jim Grizzell can absolutely make sure that, that Catherine Herdering knows that um, we have a certificate for her recognizing her, I think, over 10 years on the Fitness Advisory Committee. Uh, she actually went from the uh, old Devalier gym <laughs> through the new fitness center. I really appreciate all of her efforts on that committee. Uh, so the last item is an appointment of committee chairs. And I really want to thank these people for stepping forward to lead our advisory committees for a one-year term effective July 1st. So Aquatics Committee, Daryl Svoboda, Audit Committee, Ben Bernstein, Finance Committee, Adrian Byram, Fitness Center Advisory Committee, Jim Grizel, and Golf Advisory Committee, Burke Ferrari. Thank you. Thank you, Dwight. And thank you, everyone, for volunteering for our committees. Um, for announcements, uh, there will not be a mid-month meeting of the board in the month of July. Um, and the end of month regular meeting of the board will be held on Thursday, July 28th at 9 a.m. at the Peacock Hall and Gateway Complex and via Zoom. At this moment, at 11.35, we will be recessing into the executive session. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.